Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. You know, Tracy, there are a lot of great doctors at the Mayo Clinic, but there are some who just sort of stand out above the crowd, like Mayo Clinic hematologist Dr. Robert Kyle. Hematologists deal with blood blood problems. I think the most important of the cancer doctors. That's just me. (laughs) For more than six decades, Dr. Kyle has been on the cutting edge of medical research and technology. His colleagues would tell you that he has helped to break new ground in the practice of medicine, especially for patients with a blood cancer called myeloma. And we're privileged to have Dr. Kyle as our guest on Mayo Clinic Radio. It's very nice to meet you. It's a pleasure for me. Dr. Kyle, nice to have you. First of all, congratulations on a stellar career at the Mayo Clinic, which is still not over. Uh, Fortunately not. No, so you come in every day still? (laughs) Yes, I do. And you've been here, what, 58 years or so? I've been here 66 years since I started as a fellow, actually. Uh, Okay. And on the staff for nearly 60? Yes, that is correct. (laughs) Let's go back to, you were born in North Dakota, right? Correct. Tell us about your upbringing, because you weren't always set on a career in medicine, right? Uh, No. I... uh, uh, was always interested in school and in fact uh, uh, when I was five years of age I uh, asked my mother if I could uh, go to school and visit for a day and she of course said well okay (laughs) and uh, then I did so and uh, then I uh, uh, told my mother that uh, I wanted to uh, go to school this next fall. And she said, well, you're only five years old. You shouldn't start until <laughs> you're six. No kindergarten, of course, at that oh. time. And uh, so she talked to the teacher, and the teacher, I guess, uh, didn't uh, object. After all, she had 15, 18 children in a one-room school uh, covering the eight grades. So she just uh, took me on. And then uh, when I was in the sixth grade in uh, North Dakota, you have to take examinations at the end of the seventh and the eighth grades in order to go on to the next level. (laughs) And so the teacher asked me if I wanted to uh, uh, take the uh, examinations for practice and uh, not knowing any better, I uh, said, well, okay. And uh, then she uh, 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 reported to me that uh, my grades were uh, very high and that uh, uh, she uh, was going to talk to my mother about this. (laughs) And my parents didn't really know what to do with me either. So uh, finally, the teacher uh, decided to uh, uh, promote me to the eighth grade. And so I completed that and uh, did the examinations for the eighth grade. And, uh, you know, we oftentimes think about uh, all of the uh, testing and so forth that is done on students. But uh, uh, that's not exactly new. Uh, Yes, not. At least not in North Dakota. No, no. (laughs) And they were very strict about it because if you did not pass, you did not go on to high school. How did you know you wanted to study medicine? Well, I didn't, uh, of course, at that time. But uh, one day my mother was talking to a friend of hers and uh, and, uh, the friend said uh, uh, in response to what I should do is... uh, Why doesn't he become a doctor? And I didn't think anything about it, but I was interested in the sciences. And when I graduated from high school, I uh, 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 went into pre-med. But weren't you in, uh, you went to the University of North Dakota, is that right? But weren't you in forestry for a while? I went to the North Dakota School of Forestry, but I was not in forestry per se. I was in pre-med all the time. And then you had a brother who was ill, became ill? Yes, I had a brother uh, who uh, developed a severe uh, headache one morning and uh, uh, very soon his speech was uh, slurred and I knew there was something very wrong with him. So I uh, uh, 
got our family doctor, and by that time he could scarcely walk and was admitted to the local hospital. The physician, however, had seen uh, meningitis as an intern Mm -hmm. and uh, treated him for it. Bacterial meningitis, I it presume? It was meningococ- meningococcal meningitis. And they, and they had antibiotics for it? And uh, they, uh, he was treated with sulfa, actually. This would be in 1945. Wow. And then, from there, medical school where? Uh, at uh, Northwestern. You must have passed another test. And Did they have MCATs back then? Did you yes, have to take they an, did. Yeah? And what actually happened was is that I, uh, the University of North Dakota had a two-year school. But uh, I, uh, the dean told me that uh, they were in difficult uh, times and that uh, the building was old and that it would probably close if they could not get a state referendum passed. So uh, he said, well, uh, uh, grades are good. Why don't you apply at a four-year school? And said, well, if you want to be a a professor, uh, apply at Harvard. If you want to do research, go to the University of Pennsylvania. But if you want to be a real doctor, (laughs) apply at Northwestern. (laughs) And, of course, I wanted to be a real doctor. And you can imagine where the dean had uh, trained. Mm -hmm. Uh, Northwestern. I think he tipped his cards a little bit there. (laughs) And then um, after medical school, how did you? ultimately end up at Mayo Clinic? Well, I decided during medical school that I was more interested in uh, medicine than I was in surgery. And uh, uh, I took my internship and the main, the major uh, physician or the leading physician had trained here. And so uh, uh, other People had gone from Northwestern to Mayo Clinic, and so I did the same. And then you ultimately specialized in the field of hematology, blood disorders, but with a particular interest in myeloma. How did you get so interested in in myeloma? Well, uh, uh, we had to spend six months in a laboratory at that time as a part of our internal medicine training. And I signed up for hematology because I knew less about it than anything else. And then when I finished the laboratory, I realized that I didn't know anything about the clinical aspects. So I took the hospital service, and on that hospital service, two things happened. First, I saw an electrophoretic pattern. I had never seen one before because it was a new test. And uh, uh, Ned Baird, who was the consultant on the service, uh, said, why don't you look into it? And so I did and uh, reviewed the 6,000 patterns that had been done here and uh, wrote a paper that was published. And then during that same hospitalization, a woman was admitted to the hospital uh, with myeloma for radiation therapy. But as I read the uh, chart, uh, she had had uh, a biopsy, and the biopsy showed amyloid. And I said to myself, what in the world is that? I had never seen, or more appropriately, uh, had never recognized a patient of amyloidosis in four years of medical school, a uh, internship, two years in the Air Force as a physician, and three and a half years as a fellow at the Mayo Clinic. So I had seen a goodly number of patients. So amyloid is an abnormal protein that uh, uh, collects, and you you saw that in a patient that you hadn't seen before. But I hadn't seen that. I hadn't recognized this before as a more appropriate term. And then this, sorry, back to the serum protein electrophoresis. This, This is a study... Uh, that are, are you the one who figured out that there was a particular pattern for that patients um, for, with myeloma have? Uh, yes, uh, that was uh, uh, that was the so-called spike in the electrophoretic pattern, and uh, 
I reviewed those patterns and found that the vast majority of them did have multiple myeloma or Waldenstrom's macroglobulin anemia. Okay, multiple myeloma. Tell us a little bit about the disease in, in lay terms. I mean, it's a cancer of the blood. It's a cancer of the bone marrow, basically. And these plasma cells uh, become malignant continue to grow and produce more protein and damage the uh, bone. And did patients ever survive myeloma? I mean, now it seems like it's getting to be, uh, you know, you can maybe get a few years, up to five years, and some survival stories. But back when you started doing this, was there ever anyone who survived myeloma? Well, only for a very limited period of time. In my mm -hmm. textbook in uh, medicine, it uh, said that there were two treatments for multiple myeloma. One was x-ray therapy, radiation therapy, and the other was blood transfusion. There was no chemotherapy. No drugs available. So have you studied multiple drugs for myeloma? And, and today they're much better. I mean, the survival, the average survival for a patient with myeloma, when I went through medical school and even residency, was about three years. What is it now? Uh, it is probably uh, eight or nine years. And for patients with good risk disease, it's even longer than that. And in fact, about a fourth of patients with multiple myeloma are actually cured, or perhaps more appropriately said, die of another disease other than their multiple wow. myeloma. That's amazing. Uh, what would you say is your most significant? When you look back on your career, there, you've made so many contributions. Which isn't but, over yet. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> What's, what has been your most significant contribution in your mind? Well, probably the major thing has been the, uh, uh, the uh, development of my younger colleagues and, uh, in the field of dysproteinemias, which include myeloma, macroglobulinemia, and AL amyloidosis as the major ones. The other specific thing is the recognition of a protein abnormality in the blood that uh, uh, I named uh, uh, monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, AMGUS or MUGUS. And this particular protein is found initially in every one of these dysproteinemia diseases. Well, uh, what's your secret for success? I mean, why have you been so successful, would you say? Well, I think it's uh, mainly uh, a uh, curiosity and wondering uh, how things happen and uh, uh, what is important. And uh, I stumbled onto the monoclonal gammopathy uh, somewhat by accident. There was a patient who was here with multiple myeloma. And in reviewing her history, she had been here almost 20 years before, and at that time she had an increase in globulins uh, in her blood, but no one could uh, uh, measure them, and uh, so the physician advised no treatment for mm -hmm. this individual, patted her on the shoulder and said, yeah, uh, come back uh, 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 at some time. Oh she came back 13 years later, <laughs> at which time electrophoresis was available and she had this large spike in her serum. Uh, she still had no symptoms and then six or seven years later she developed back pain and the full-blown picture of a very uh, active, progressive, multiple myeloma, which led to her demise uh, seven or eight months later. And so that seemed kind of strange. And so I started looking for these uh, proteins in the blood, and they were there, and uh, began to uh, collect them. And over the next uh, 10 years, uh, found a goodly number, uh, published uh, 
241 of them in 1978 and named the condition monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, are which you, is more than a mouthful. <laughs> are you still seeing patients? Are you still doing research? What are you still doing each day? I uh, come in each morning about 7.30 in the morning and uh, uh, look at my emails and uh, there are a lot of things that happen throughout the day and I am busy until uh, uh, 4, 4.30 in the afternoon and uh, I uh, still come in on Saturday mornings because when I came to the clinic, the clinic was open Saturday. on Saturday mornings. Mm -hmm. And Saturday mornings, one saw patients until 12, 1 o'clock, or sometimes a little bit later. So that habit, I guess, is uh, stuck. How uh, is it? So you're into your 90s now? Is yes. That how, okay, how old are you? I am 91. Okay. How have you prevented physician burnout? Well, uh, just coming to work every day, but <laughs> to be a little more uh, specific, uh, uh, my wife and I, uh, Charlene, have done a lot of travel over the years, and uh, our son John is also very interested in travel, plans trips, and uh, we have uh, driven uh, all over the world, so to speak, uh, uh, many trips uh, throughout uh, Europe, Australia, South Africa, and uh, so forth. And then in addition to this, uh, I uh, uh, have a hobby, uh, stamp collecting. Mm, that, a philatelist. Yeah. <laughs> well, what... what? <laughs> Gesundheit. <laughs> what uh, what do you what do you suggest that some of these younger physicians do? I mean, what is it that brings you joy that you try to impart to them? Well, one of the things I emphasize to them is that when they go to a meeting, ask to uh, speak someplace or something like that, to always sample something in the city. Uh, go to a museum, uh, see something of historical interest, and I've always had an interest in both history and geography, and uh, to do something. Uh, and I always tell them that an airplane is an airplane, a hotel is a hotel, an auditorium is an auditorium, <clears throat> but you need to get out and do something, squeeze in a few hours on each trip. Now, that's easier nowadays for me than it is uh, for the very, very busy uh, uh, physician who has to get back to his or her patients. So it's very important to have other interests, whether it's Absolutely. travel or stamp collecting, uh, and that can help prevent physician burnout. It's, it's interesting that it's such a, a common phenomenon now and that everybody talks about it. Physician burnout. Yes. I never felt it. I didn't, or I haven't either, <laughs> and uh, and uh, it's uh, I don't know. Uh, it's uh, hard to a lot is written it? about it, and I suppose that uh, uh, that uh, physicians nowadays kind of keep thinking about it and so forth. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, we just never never mentioned it. Well, again. Congratulations on a great career and an incredible 60-plus uh, year career at the Mayo Clinic, and it's not over. Dr. Kyle is considered a multiple myeloma pioneer. That's what his, his colleagues would uh, call him. He's had He has done groundbreaking work that has changed the practice of hematology, blood disorders, and he's improved the lives and the longevity of virtually thousands of patients. And he says, whenever you go on a trip or a meeting, make sure you <laughs> sample something in the city. I like it. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Kyle. Appreciate having you here. It's been my privilege, and thank you very much. And that's our program for this week.